All right, good morning, everybody. So uh, yesterday I had the, uh, the nap session. That's the one that occurs right after lunch. And, uh, and I think I'm in the middle of the hangover session. This is the one where you couldn't quite make it in the morning um, to get here. Uh, we're, we seem unbalanced. We're all shifted to the side of the plane. If you've ever flown into Aspen, it would actually get you to stand up and partially move on over uh, to balance the plane out so we could take care of that. Uh, this morning, you know, I'm not very far away, but I was tempted to take a cab. Uh, they had a radio dispatched one in the front, and they had a computer dispatched one, but they didn't have an ASIO dispatched <laughs> cab, and so I was just like, hmm, it seems like it might be bad luck, actually, to do that. So this morning, we're going to talk about um, Boost, ASIO. Um, Chris, uh, the author of the, of the library, calls it ASIO. I, unfortunately, have come into the habit of calling it ASIO or something else. And um, I'll, I'll try to do my best here to not butcher the name for him. Um, so uh, the goal this morning is to talk about the library from the standpoint of how you might want to use it. Um, and the documentation for the library is, is really, really good. I'm not going to spend time talking about a ton of the functions. I'm going to spend time talking about the things that I find users have problems with um, when using this, this program, or excuse me, this library. And um, I, for some reason, I really love IRC and the Boost IRC channel. And so for the last eight years or so, I've been helping people use this. And, um, and we'll see kind of how we're going to um, have some problems how we're going to resolve some of the problems. So it started off as an asynchronous uh, networking library, but it started supporting all kinds of different things, serial ports, timers, file descriptors. Um, you can write your own um, interface uh, of sorts. It uses a proactor model. That's usually where people get tripped up a little bit. Uh, it's extremely scalable as um, far as connections that can be supported. And it provides this portable, abstract, um, portable um, networking layer for this abstraction so that you can write um, cross-platform and just, just deal with the library as it is. So what is uh, asynchronous I.O.? Um, so some time ago when my children were younger, uh, first of all, to be a child in our household, by age five you have to know how to use the espresso machine. It's just a requirement because your parents want espresso and um, that's your job in the household. That's why you're going to get fed and you know, have a place to sleep. So, um, we, daughter number one, my eldest daughter, uh, I would ask, please make me a coffee. And she'd say, sure, Dad. She actually loved making coffee. And so she would run on over to the espresso machine. I would continue to work at my office. And she would come on back with a cappuccino, hand it to me, and say, here, Dad, here's your coffee. And I'd say, thank you. That was an asynchronous transaction. I continued to do my work. I requested something to occur. Off it went, and then it came back. Uh, daughter number three was very enthusiastic about making coffee. In fact, she would ask first, do you want a coffee? And um, of course, yes, please, I would love a coffee. And we would both get up and walk to the machine. And I would supervise, and she would push buttons and do the things you have to do to make it go. And I would then walk with her back to my office, sit down at my desk, and then she would hand me my coffee. And um, I'd thank her and I'd drink my coffee. That was not an asynchronous transaction. It's how, unfortunately, a lot of people, though, do I.O. still today. And we want to get away from that blocking. Um, so you, know, you might have an interface of some sort that reads a, reads a file. It takes a file name and you pass it a buffer and a handler read done. That might be an asynchronous type transaction. So why do we want to do this? Well, if you have a client connected to a server, you might write this in such a way where you have uh, a read thread and a write thread. And that, that might be okay, but it's not going to scale very well. Um, it's amazing the number of client um, offices that I show up at, and they have code that you know, looks like this, basically. They've got a reader and a writer thread. Sometimes they have a manager thread to deal with what happens when the readers and writers go away. Occasionally they have like this third thread that I haven't quite figured out what it does, but it's associated with every client that's connected. 
and you just have swarms and swarms of threads. It's not very efficient, doesn't scale well at all. Instead, we should probably be able to do something like this. We've got lots of clients still connected to the server, but perhaps a single thread for both the read and the write because of the load that we have or, um, or the type of transactions that we're performing. So we would like to get to an asynchronous model, but we'd like to do it easily. All right, this is where the house lights dim and we tell a story. It's a pro actor story or purple slushies, butlers, and brain freeze. Mom, dad, Johnny, and butler go to the beach. Dad tells butler to wait at the slushy shack. After some time, dad and Johnny go get a slushy. Dad brings his own cup. He is greeted by the owner. I would like to order a slushy. Here is my cup. Please deliver it to Johnny when it's ready. Dad heads off to explore the beach. Johnny builds a sandcastle. Owner begins to make the slushy, and Butler waits. Owner starts the blender and goes back to take the next customer's order. Ding! Slushy is ready, and owner moves the cup to the completion table where assistant is waiting. The assistant gives the slushy to Butler for delivery to Johnny. Butler is happy to have something to do. Butler delivers the slushy to Johnny, who is happy too. Butler returns to the slushy shack and waits. Sometimes dad will order multiple slushies, one for mom, one for Johnny. That isn't a problem. Assistant just gives the first one ready to Butler. Butler can only deliver one at a time and returns for the second slushy. Other families come to the beach and bring their butlers, who also wait at the slushy completion line. This works well because it helps keep assistant slushy completion table empty. Assistant still remembers that fateful day when no butlers came to the beach. There was also the time that each kid brought a butler. Disaster! No room at the shack. Too busy, yet nothing was getting done. The families agreed that two butlers would be plenty for all. Now they share. Occasionally, tragedy strikes. Johnny will leave to chase waves without getting his slushy. Butler will die of exhaustion trying to find him. Or somebody will take their cup and go home while the slushy is being made. Then it gets poured on the floor. Yuck. Dad is sometimes very generous. Johnny would like one orange and one purple slushy. If both slushies are done at the same time and both butlers are available, then Johnny gets two slushies at once. This confuses Johnny and causes brain freeze. Susie is smarter and doesn't mind both slushies at one time. But most often, the dads are making requests to the owner. The assistant is monitoring the table. The kids are building sandcastles and the butlers are waiting. All right, so what's the purpose of this story? Well, first of all, pro-actor diagrams are incredibly boring to look at. <laughs> the second part of it is um, I create mental models or world views of how things work, and, and I need those, uh, I, and I suspect most of you also have one. If you don't understand the intricacies behind the code, uh, you have some mental model that you've created, and you push and you shove at it a little bit, and it breaks, and then you adjust your worldview, and you do that over and over again. Uh, this little story came about long ago 
uh, in order to help me actually understand how this stuff works. So we have some credits. Uh, the initiator, if you're, if you're familiar with the proactor model, the initiator was being played by dad. The asynchronous operation processor was the owner. The proactor was the butler. The asynchronous event demultiplexer was the assistant. Asynchronous operations, it's the blender making slushy. The completion event queue is the completion table. The completion handler is Johnny. Um, we had some additional roles. The operating system played the blender, was played by the blender. The memory to be filled is the empty cup and data in memory is a full cup. If you are um, more into diagrams like this, there you go. That's what it really looks like. So. Um, this is that pro-actor model. Now there are some lessons that we can take away and we can learn from this. And if we take those lessons from that little story um, and we just kind of apply them to our usage of the pro-actor, we pretty much will be safe most of the time. First of all, all threads of activity inside of the slushy shack, the actions that were going on in slushy shack, they stayed in the slushy shack. They never actually exited. The butler delivered the results to the completion handler. The butler or the handler thread uh, was supplied by the family or the application supplies the thread that's going to be used for the delivery. The cup or memory, it was also supplied by the application and it's owned by the application. So this is a major difference between a reactor and a proactor. Not all handlers, Johnny, liked having multiple results delivered at the same time. You have code that doesn't like to be reentrant. It doesn't like to be called that handler doesn't want to be called by multiple threads. Some handlers, Susie, didn't care. It was okay. You might have code in which the handlers can be called by multiple threads. Don't leave the beach or the scope when a slushy is being made for you. It's very rude and the handler won't be able to find you later. The I'm sorry, the, the, um, the completion handler will not be there and uh, the thread will not be able to find it. So a few handlers or threads um, butlers can service many completion routines. You don't need slews of these things. So those are some of the takeaways that we can get. Um, what does it look like when we want to use one of these? So we start off um, by creating one of these IO service objects. Um, we're going to use timers for a little bit just to kind of wrap our hands around some of the basics of how, how the system is going to work. So we're going to create a deadline timer. The deadline timer um, is past uh, the, the I.O. service as its first argument, and then it's provided with uh, the, in this case, the relative time um, that once it's activated, how long it will take until the, the timer expires. We are going to call timer.async wait, and at that point, the, that's when the timer is going to begin. Uh, the timer is going to be excuse me, the async wait is going to be past a completion handler. This completion handler is going to do nothing except print out what time it is and that the timer expired. Um, we're going to print out calling run and then service.run. So calling run on the IO service, that is the thread that's going to service the completion handlers. That's equivalent to the butler in the story. So each time I call run, on each of those threads, that is another thread that can handle completions for me. So I do this and I get calling IO service run. Um, five seconds later, the timer expired and uh, then we exit. So makes sense, right? How that might work. Now what's going on um, when we call async wait? Well, that request has come in. It's sitting there, which is just a timer, it's sitting there waiting to be done. Once it's done, it is placed on the completion queue. The next available thread will pick that up and deliver it to the handler that wants it, the completion handler. Uh, let's do this with a thread. So we can go ahead and create two different timers. Both are going to be five seconds. Uh, we're going to start an async wait on each of them. And um, we will have one thread that we're going to start off that is going to call run on the I.O. service. Uh, timer expired does nothing except for print out that we've entered timer expired. It waits for three seconds and then it prints that it's exiting. So we start these things off. 
they should each go off basically about the same time, right? So they're, they're supposed to go off at five seconds. So each of them will be wanting to, um, each of them will produce the completion. They'll be stuck on the completion queue. There's only one thread, so the thread will have to handle one at a time, whichever one ends up in the queue first will be handled. And then the next one. So we're gonna get this type of an output. Timer one uh, ended up hitting it first, and so uh, we see enter and leave for timer one. Notice it's in there for three seconds, and then right away, timer two. Because the thread has now um, finished running for the handler, it's gone back. There's something else in the completion queue that's able to pick up and then take care of that, um, that handler. Um, this is that idea of the butler can only deliver one slushy at a time. Yes, so the question, um, Arthur is asking uh, leading questions here. <laughs> um, yeah, it looks like service.run uh, is expecting that there is work to do, um, is the basic comment. And yes, it's looking that there is work to do. How does it know when it's all done? When there's, when there's nothing left inside of, you can think of it as a slushy check, when there's nothing left inside of the proactor to do, there's no more work inside of the to be done work, there's nothing inside of the completion queue, then the run will return. Uh, we won't talk about it, we don't have a lot of time, but what you'll want to do is you want to create what's a work object. You'll instantiate this work object. It doesn't actually perform any work, but you will put it inside of, um, inside of the I.O. service. And as long as that object's alive, uh, the I.O. service will stay alive. And so uh, that's the kind of the trick. You typically will um, use something like a shared pointer, pass it in, um, and then later on you might delete it. That would be the way to take care of that. So, um, all right, how about if we do this now with two threads? So the same setup. We've got two timers. Each of the timers are gonna go off in five seconds. We call async wait, which starts that off. It delivers it, delivers it to be the work to be done. Um, we now have the two threads that are running service.run. Uh, we should now be able to pick up both items off of the, the completion queue and, um, and run their handlers. And indeed we do, and we get a garbled mess, as we would expect. And, um, all right, so we've got a garbled mess because both handlers are being executed simultaneously by two different threads. Does that make sense? <clears throat> all right, so we can also just post work. We can just say, this is equivalent of, of the owner just placing items directly. There's, no, there's nothing to be done. There's no I.O. to fetch. There's no timer. There's nothing associated with it. We're just going to take um, a handler, and we're going to stick it on the completion queue for the next thread to pick up. Um, all right, so we are going to do this by using post. So in the I.O. service, we call post dot, I'm sorry, service dot post, and then we give it the work that we want it to do. Uh, eat, drink, and be merry. We're going to provide a thread to execute the run. Um, and uh, we get our eat, eat, drink, and be merry. So uh, th this, in essence, is a thread queue for us, right? Um, in fact, a very common pattern when you're writing code uh, using the asynchronous I.O. library is you will have a layer that is your communication layer. Um, and it has an I.O. service. And then you have another I.O. service that will be taking care of all the, the heavy lifting processing. And the two layers do nothing more than um, pass off work between one another. So as communication comes in, you can, you can uh, delegate the number of threads you might need for your communications. And then you pass that off to another I.O. service, um, and those items get posted, and you now have the work queue in which you can provide as many threads as you need to actually perform the work that you want to get done. All right, so um, we have this Johnny who could not handle two slushies. This is our same problem. We've got both five seconds, that five second timers that are going off at the exact same time. Um, and it created this garble mess, right? What do we do when, um, when we can't handle this? So you know, there are a variety of different things that we may want to do. You know, we may want to like, get out our handy mutex. We might want to do a lot of different synchronization things that we might know about. Don't do any of those. Use the 
um, use the constructs that are inside of the library. And what's inside of the library is called a strand. And so the code now has changed slightly. We've created, um, out of the IO service has this thing called a strand. We've taken and created a strand object. We pass it the service. Um, these are the key bits here that we've added. So we've got a strand, and now instead of just calling async wait and giving it the completion handler, what I want you to run when that happens, I actually take the strand and I wrap my completion handler. The completion handler, or excuse me, the strand, the strand will ensure that, uh, that there is not, um, that only one completion handler that is wrapped by the same strand will run at the same time. And that will take care of any of the threading issues that I might have. So I might have lots of threads, and I might have lots of things on the completion queue, items on the completion queue that need to be called, but those handlers will not get called um, if they are wrapped by the same strand. So let's take a look at that. Um, well, first we can take a look at this. We have now um, what looks like the serialized example we had previously. Even though we have two threads running, uh, timer one enters first. We have to wait three seconds before we can actually see that uh, timer number two will then get called. Uh, let's do something a little bit different here. Let's add a third timer uh, for six seconds. And when we start its async wait, we will not wrap it inside the strand. So timer number one and timer number two are five seconds. They're wrapped in the same strand. They're gonna go off at the same time. Timer number three is six seconds. It's not wrapped inside the strand. And so what would we expect to see? Well, we expect to see that one and two are serialized in whichever order, um, order is not, is not deterministic. So wh whichever order it occurs first inside the completion queue and they get picked up. Um, and we would expect to see, because there's a, another thread hanging out, that timer number three will go ahead and be invoked. And we do see that. So timer one um, goes off. And then a second later, we can see that timer three we've entered, timer one finally leaves, and timer two can begin. And then our timer three is finally leaving, and then timer two. So if you have things that need to be serialized, for example, in I.O., uh, we can't be going around writing to a TCP socket from multiple threads at the same time, right? That's a disaster. So writes, we would want to wrap inside of a strand. We would want to make sure that the access to that writing process is, is protected. Uh, let's talk just briefly about um, one more thing here that will kind of get us going. And uh, the, the ASIO library um, in essence, uses this concept of views uh, into data. Remember the, the concept of the cup in the story. The application owns that memory. And so when you pass something off, all you're really passing is a view internally. Don't, don't let the memory fall off the stack. Don't delete the memory while it's in the middle of being utilized by uh, ASIO because you will, you will crash. Um, the memory will just go away. So the idea is buffers. Um, and buffers, mentally, we can think about buffers as, as being modeled by um, a tuple of a void star and some size and bytes. Um, so mentally, we think about it like that, um, of what's, what we're passing off and what's being stored. There are mutable buffers and there are const buffers. And of course, we can convert mutable buffers into const buffers so they appear to be very c y the way we like them. So we have a mutable buffer and a const buffer. Um, the, the other thing that is supported is scattergather. So if we have um, several buffers that are stored inside of a container, we will then um, we will get a behavior in which all of those appear to, like a DMA operation, all of those will appear to go on out. If we have a container, um, like a vector of buffers, those can then utilize for reads. Uh, Again, buffers do not own their underlying data. Here's an example in code. So if we were to send from a socket, um, and this is just blocking sends, we could take in the first example and use this function called buffer, which will take the argument and then return a buffer type that can be used. Um, so we're passing a data in size and we're gonna get one of these buffer types, or there are overloads for all kinds of things. 
So like a string, I just say buffer and then wrap personal message inside of, um, excuse me, um, call buffer with personal message, the string, and we get a buffer back um, or a standard array at the bottom. So uh, ASIO has a lot of overloads for uh, the buffer call and uh, you will then get an appropriate buffer back that can just be passed off. It does nothing more than figures out where's the pointer to the beginning and how large is this thing that, how many elements, and then that's what actually ends up inside um, that you're passing around. Here's an example of the scatter gather. So uh, pretend we have some protocol in which we have some header that's going to be going out, the message, and then we have this additional data piece. Uh, I can create now a vector of these and when I call send, I can just pass the vector of these buffers, and those will then be sent out efficiently. All right, does that make sense? Let's build a server. And uh, the way we're gonna go about this is we're gonna build it and uh, just kind of worry about some of the problems that we often have when we're building these things. Uh, the, let's envision a chat server of some sort. There's some centralized um, server and there are clients that are connecting to it and when the client sends a message, then that message is broadcast to all the different clients. Uh, the, the client on the top, it has initiated the connection, so a TCP connection has come in. It connects right on a port and then that gets handed off to another port. From that point on, the Communication is on some other port that's occurring, right? Now, here's the question of the day. Who owns this client handler? If I have an object that represents the connection between the client and the server, up here it's called client handler, who owns that thing? So there are lots of, uh, the, lots of ways to do this. Um, Unfortunately, it seems like a very common way is to say, well, you know, it's, it's owned by some manager and, you know, the manager keeps a list of all the client handlers and occasionally it goes through and it checks to see whether they're still connected or not. Uh, if they've lost a connection, then they clean them up. Um, you know, and, and so you've got something over here doing some work to make sure that all these client handlers still need to be around. If not, it takes care of, of deleting them. Uh, my, my first job out of college, um, I had a manager, um, we, were, we were sitting inside of a, a code review. Um, the manager had joined the code review. And um, probably unwittingly, he says about a piece of code, he says, what is that manager doing? Managers are not supposed to do work. And um, you know that was that was great. We tried to hold it in for a little bit. Reviews were coming up soon. Um, but you know, if you are designing something and you have resource managers that are doing nothing more than going around checking to see whether or not the resource should be alive anymore or not, you probably don't have your design right. There's probably something wrong in the design. You haven't thought about really ownership and what the ownership model is long enough. What's the ownership of the client handler? Well, when the client handler has no more work to do, then the client handler should go away. Well, what's no more work? In this case, it's, it has nothing left to send, or it has the inability to read anymore. The client on the other side has gone away. So for us, this connection has gone away. The client handler has no more connection, um, or, or there's no more work internally. So it might be that the client handler connection has gone away, but internally it has like a bunch of buffers and things that it's in the middle of. It's got completion handlers. It's got to clean all that up, right? Those are, those are still things that have to happen. What knows best on whether it should still be alive or not? The client handler, right, itself. And so we're going to um, need to come up with a mechanism in order to keep the client handler alive um, that is the client handler itself doing the work. All right, and one way of doing this, chaining was probably a really bad word up there. We won't, we're not really chaining completion handlers here. This is not what we're talking about. What we're talking about is when the completion handler runs, um, for example, here we have a read done. So I've begun to read, um, 
into the, a I called an async read, so I provided it the buffer that I wanted to read the data into, and I've given it the completion handler, when you're done, call this handler. When that runs, I need to look to see whether there's an error or not. If there was not an error, then um, I will do some work and I will queue another read. I'll start the read inside of the asynchronous, um, another asynchronous read with a completion handle again. If there was an error, I won't start a read again, right? I'll just kind of like fall out. And if I keep using this pattern by not queuing up more work and another completion handler, if I can now figure out how to bind in my lifetime, everything should be fine. So here's the goal. We want to write these two lines of code, and we want to end up with um, some server that's listening on 8888. And we're going to try to do it in some generic way. So uh, we have this um, ASIO generic server. It is going to be instantiated uh, with chat handler, and chat handler will basically be the type of the different handlers, or the, excuse me, the type of the handler that will handle the connection with the client. All right, so it's going to instantiate a new one of those each time that a client connects. That's the goal. So what does the generic server side look like? How do we get a server up? Well, we're going to start off with saying that we, um, let's just create a type alias. It's the shared handler underscore T. This is type alias, and it's nothing more than a shared pointer to the um, type of the connection handler, where the connection handler is the type that is going to be instantiated for each of these connections. Uh, what are we going to have internally? Well, we're going to actually, we're going to have a thread count. We may want some number of threads um, to, to deal with this connection. Um, so that'll be our thread pool. We're going to, of course, have an I.O. service, the server itself. And we're going to need an acceptor. This is how we're going to uh, get the connections in for our TCP connections. What does the, uh, the constructor look like? The constructor is going to take the number of threads that we want the server to operate with. Um, and so we've got thread count. We're going to um, initialize the acceptor with the I.O. service. Everything in ASIO that has, has to do with services needs to know the I.O. service that they're working with. Um, and so you can have multiple I.O. services in your program, and they then need to be associated with the service itself. Excuse me, the service itself needs to be associated with, this, with that. We're going to have two main methods. Uh, the first method we already saw was the start server, where we pass the port. And the other is we're going to have a handle new connection method. And as you can imagine, this is as a new connection comes in, this is the handler that's going to get called. So let's take a look. What's inside of our start server? So start server, uh, the first thing we're going to do inside of start server is we're going to make shared um, on the type that is going to handle the connection. So we're going to get a shared pointer object to the type that's handling the connection. We're passing it to I.O. service. And now we have that handler. We're going to set up the listen. So we have an endpoint. Uh, we're going to use TCP v4, pass it the port number. We're going to open the acceptor, passing it the, that endpoint protocol. Um, we can set options, such as reuse address. Uh, we're going to bind to the endpoint, and then we're going to begin the listen. And now here is the asynchronous part. Acceptor async accept. We provide it the socket that we're going to um, that we're going to transfer. So as a as a client connects, it accepts and then it gets transferred to the to the other socket, right? The, the one that we're going to actually do the accept on. Um, that's that. As you can see, it's inside of the handler. Handler contains its socket that's going to, going to um, continue to, to uh, communicate on. And then the completion handler for the async accept is um, this handle new connection. And then we're going to start up our thread pool by however many, calling run on the I.O. service however many times for threads that we, that we want. Oh, 
Oh, uh, so the question is, is does, uh, do we need to uh, use STD ref for the I.O. service? Um, so I, I haven't told you what the, what the requirements are yet of our client. Um, so that would be true if we received the I.O. service by value. Uh, then we would need a reference wrapper. But in this case, uh, we're actually going to receive it by reference. So it'll be OK. All right, so what does a handle new connection look like? So handle new connection, um, it's going to take the handler, so no, notice here um, when we got this thing going, our handle new connection passed in the handler and the error code. That's what it's getting called with, the handler and the error code. Handler is what? Well, handler is the shared pointer of the thing that's going to handle our connection. And in doing this, by capturing by value, we have taken this, this um, shared pointer object and we have bound it up and stuck it inside of uh, the I.O. service, right? So the lifetime of my handler is, even though we're going to leave scope, I'm not, I'm not going to die. It's still alive. Um, so when I call this, I have the handler and the error code. First thing I want to do is I want to check to see whether or not I had an error. If there's an error, I just return. I bail. Now, in returning, um, that completion handler is what had the handler bound to it initially. And so um, you can see I'm going to start tearing down everything that no longer has a reference count inside of the I.O. service will start falling apart. And then I'm going to call handler start. Um, I'm going to create a new handler just like before with make shared and then start my, my async accept again. And what is its completion handler itself? So now, we've, once we've got things going, then handle new connection basically looks like get, this, get the error code. If there was an error, just bail. If there's not, continue on. What does continue on look like? The handler that's received the connection, start it. Create a new handler for the next connection that's going to come in call the async accept, pass that by, excuse me, capture that by value into the completion handler and then continue on. Now this is, this is going to take care of all the accepts for me. So what does the actual chat handler look like? This is the object that's communicating now with, with the end bit. Can we get a time check? Thank you. All right, so the, hand, the chat handler, this is the, the, the object that's handling the communication per uh, connection that comes in. The first thing you notice is that it inherits from enabled shared from this, passing its own type. So this is, uh, this is CRTP, you know, you, Tell it right away because you're passing the same type as what you are inside of your inherited type. CRTP is curiously recurring template pattern because we're not really all that good at naming. Um, and so we've got, in essence, a pattern that allows us to do static polymorphism or inject behaviors. And what this one's doing is it's allowing us to inject behavior. Uh, enabled shared from this lets the class be able to get what appears to be a shared pointer to itself at any particular time. Why would something want a shared pointer to itself? To control its lifetime. That's why it would want one. So if it calls shared from this, it's going to get a shared pointer to what appears to be its own object. And it could then bind that into something else, maybe stick it on a queue, maybe pass it around. It could be completely hidden, but as long as that object's around, there's a reference count to that particular instance of the object, right? So very common pattern to bind up a shared from this into something. Maybe it's a capture in a lambda that's never actually used, but it's part of the capture that will extend the lifetime of the object. So what else do we have inside here? Um, we've got to have the service, so we're going to actually have the service by reference. 
we have a socket. This is the socket that the client wants to communicate on. We're going to have a write strand because we can't do multiple writes. Um, we, we don't know how many threads we might be dealing with and we can't from multiple threads do writes simultaneously. That would just be a disaster, right? We would get interleaved data and something would be upset with us. We're gonna use something a little bit different. So far we've just seen these buffers. Uh, ASIO also supports uh, concepts of stream buffers. And so we're gonna use a stream buffer for this example. And then for um, sending data out. So data coming in, we're gonna use the stream buffer. Data going out, we're just going to take and use a deck of strings to represent those packets at the moment. So you can imagine the user of this thing wants to be sending messages in our, in our example that we have. Uh, the server is receiving different packets or messages from these different clients. It's a chat program, so as it receives one, it needs to package that up and then send it out to every client that's currently connected. And so it's just queuing these up. So there might be a bunch of them that are queued up. The deck is going to handle that for us. Construction is very simple. We're going to receive the I.O. service by reference. The socket needs to be initialized with the service as well as the strand. Socket did nothing more than returned the socket by reference. That was the socket for the chat handler. In the server side, it was using this in order to figure out which socket the client wanted to use. This is how it got that, if you recall. And then start, well, what did start do? It was the server that called start to get things going once the handler was connected. Um, it just calls read packet. So the magic must be somewhere else, and it begins with read packet. Now this is a slightly different uh, read. So we have this read until some condition. And we're going to read until, passing it, the in this case, the socket, the in packet, and in packet was a stream. So it basically has a stream buffer that's going to read into, and then we're going to give it a very simple condition, um, a null terminator. Read until you see a null terminator. And then when you see a null terminator, this is what I want you to do. So let's just get rid of some of that cruft for a moment, or the, the, the setup there. The callback handler itself is creating a, um, it's capturing shared from this, and internally inside the lambda, that's gonna be called me. The expression is going to take, uh, the expression is being set up to, to take two arguments, uh, the error code and the bytes transferred. That's what ASIO is going to call this with. So this completion handler signature looks like it's going to take actually an error code and the bytes transferred. That, that's how it's been set up. And then internally, I'm going to use that shared pointer, me, to call read packet done, passing it the error code and the bytes transferred. So what I've done is I've bundled this thing up with a shared pointer to myself by calling shared from this. I now have taken that lambda expression, becomes a closure object. That closure object now is getting put inside of the IO service as the completion handler and as long as that object's inside, this, this object here, this client object, is not going to, to um, get deleted. So I have a reference count that is going to stay alive as long as there's work to be done inside of the I.O. service. This is how I'm going to manage my lifetime. I'm gonna manage my lifetime by managing it myself, by binding up this shared from this, or a shared pointer to myself inside of the completion handlers. Um, so what does read packet done look like? Well, as you can imagine, if there's an error, I just kind of want to bail at the moment. I'm not going to think about what I'm going to do with errors. I'm just going to bail. The idea here that I want you to see is uh, we're not going to queue more work. Eventually, all the references are going to go away, and the object will go, the reference count of the object will go to zero, and then the object will be cleaned up automatically. Um, otherwise, for the read, I'm going to take that stream um, the, sorry, the in packet, I'm going to go ahead and convert that 
um, into a string, and then I could do something smart with it at this point. Uh, typically, I'd have a callback of some sort in which that gets passed off to an I.O. service that's doing the work. And then I'm going to start read packet again, right? I'm just going to call read packet again. Initiate another read. Start another read, which will now get the asynchronous read going again. So as long as reads are, are working for me, a new read will constantly be getting queued up. Queuing up a new read takes a shared from this, binds that up in the completion handler through the capture, and keeps the lifetime moving. Right? So the lifetime is always going to be fine as long as there's a read. All right, so now, how about sends? On the send side, yes, Arthur. Yeah, so in this case, uh, it is just a match. So it's going to, for the uh, async read until, it's going to read until it matches this in the stream. And these can be complicated and tricky. You can write your own um, expressions of what this might mean. You could use a regex if you wanted to. Um, so I don't, I don't recommend doing this in production code. Um, so maybe that, thank you for asking. <laughs> in production code, uh, you know, this is great on a slide. It works wonderful for getting something up right away. But uh, this is just waiting for some annoying person to overflow all the memory you have, right? Uh, so you want to actually use, um, in, my, in my opinion, you want to use a, a method that gets what's ever available now and form your own buffers along with some constraints about those, like how many bytes have I read so far? Does this pattern make any sense yet? No, it doesn't make any sense at all. Um, so that, that's how we... Um, use it, we basically read what's available. If there's nothing available, you don't, it won't return. If there is something available, it's usually whatever the packet size is, or it's whatever the chunk is that it's currently received from the TCP layer. So I've got that data to work on it one at a time. So. All right, so let's just talk about send. Uh, what do sends look like? So, remember for the send side, I can't be writing to the socket from multiple threads simultaneously. So I need to somehow take care of that problem. The reads, that wasn't a problem because I was managing the reads. And I wasn't going to start another read operation until I was done with the one that I was in the middle of. And then I would begin another read operation. So async read was getting called as I needed a new one. Um, on this side, I might have multiple threads calling the send. And there would be lots of different ways we could protect this, but let's use the mechanisms that are built in to do that. Let's, instead of creating some other way, um, using some other intrinsic, let's just use post. So service post, if you remember, is the same idea as taking that, that completion handler we pass in and just sticking it on the completion queue right away. So it's just queuing work to get done. And we're going to wrap that inside the right strand. So now, I'm guaranteed that multiple threads will not be running anything that is wrapped with my wrap, wrap strand simultaneously. What am, I, what am I putting inside of there? Again, I'm capturing uh, the shared from this. And I'm calling Q message, passing off the message that came in. So um, you know, from, from the application side, the application's calling send, passing some data, and those are getting queued. What does queue message look like? Well, we're going to look to see if the packet queue, send packet queue, which is the deck that I have, is it not empty? If it's not empty, I must have a write in progress. Now, at this point, you might go like, oh, this is a standard container. These aren't thread safe. I can't just go looking at one of these. Well, I can look at one of these, right, because I've wrapped all the access inside of the strand. So um, I'm guaranteed that only th one thread at a time is dealing with this. Uh, I'm going to push back the message that came in. And if there was not a write currently in progress, I'm going to start packet send. So what does packet send do? Packet send is going to terminate whatever was at the front. So the front was a, a, um, a string of some sort. We're going to add some null termination there. And we're going to call write, giving it the socket. And then 
This is the buffer call that's going to create an ASIO buffer for me, um, giving it front. I'm not removing the item out of the deck. I'm leaving the item in the deck at this moment, and we're just going to pass it the memory pointers, in essence, into ASIO as it's sitting inside the deck. I'm going to use, for the completion handler, of course, uh, the write strand, because I want to keep everything nice and protected for writes. Again, I'm going to pass in the shared from this, and so the shared from this is going to keep me alive as long as there's something to write. Um, and that will require the error code and the size. And then I'm going to call packet send done. So uh, the completion for sending the packet will call packet done. Packet send done. Check to see if there is an error. If there wasn't an error, it can now pop the front off the deck. That was the message that I just got done sending. I can pop that off. And if it's not empty, I'll start another packet send. So if there's, still, if there's something else in the deck, go do more work. Otherwise, I don't have anything to send, so I'll just I'll hold off, right? I've checked for error. So if it's not an error, I'm going to do that. If there was an error in this process, right now I'm just bailing. So if there was an error in this process, I'm just going to bail. By bailing, I'm not taking a shared from this, binding it up into the completion handler, and sticking it somewhere inside the I.O. service. So this is managing my life. All right. Um, so some takeaways here. Uh, you want to use a layered design. Um, you want your communication to be an I.O. service, typically, and then passing that off into another I.O. service to get the work done and use your I.O. services, um, in essence, as um, executors. So they're just going to be working on doing work, and then the, the, um, the I.O. service that's doing the work will then communicate back into the I.O. service that's actually doing the communication. Um, you can add your own services. So we've written services that talk everything from CAN bus to weird other mechanical bits and piece weird things. Um, writing your own service is super easy. And you can just look at this as, this is my centralized place to write communication bits and pieces. Uh, more often than not, what we do in our company is we actually we have a protocol that we're already interested in. And um, I've g given other talks on this you can probably find online, where we actually have something that is called the ASIO Spirit Client Handler. And um, if you've not used Spirit before, it is both a parser and a generator, domain-specific language. So, you can pass into this the grammar of what it means to take data, so structs, and how you convert those structs into byte streams. And you also pass in the grammar of how do I take byte streams and convert those back into structs. So when you instantiate one of these, you instantiate them with two grammars that describe the bidirections, and then the handlers that you're going to be listening on. In essence, what's going to probably receive the variant, or maybe it's already a, uh, a visitor that's set up for you. Uh, that's how you want to, um, that's one way that you can use this. And so you write these layers of all the communication that you want to use um, on top of um, ASIO. You can also then use it for your, your processing. Um, so as you can imagine, chat servers are easy. Uh, other things start becoming really complicated. And you've got to, you've got to think about how am I going to deal with slews of completion handlers or whatnot? How am I going to think about this problem? So for some people, completion handlers are fine. That's how, that's how they want to think about it. Um, there are, I think yesterday was um, the co-routine co -routine marathon, right? So you may want to think about things as co-routines. Uh, this works really well with co-routines. Uh, so, there are, there are different ways to do coroutines. They have um, you know, different advantages one way or the other. 
Um, I believe Gore has examples of um, why you would want to use this with uh, coroutines that he has. There are coroutines that, that Chris has that deal with, um, you can see how we do it with parsers. So we've got a stream parser that's coming in and it's bouncing back and forth between the middle of parsing and the middle of trying to get the stream. So coroutines are another way. Uh, maybe you are the type of person who's uh, more into state machines. Uh, we pair our completion handlers more actually up with MSM, MetaState Machine um, from Boost. So we can write a state machine um, and it's a very efficient state machine. We've got a bunch of tables we can look at and those events just become transitions between, between states. It's easy for us to think about. So that's a, a common way for us to deal with it. Um, and then of course you can combine this with Spirit or whatnot. Um, I really have time for both slides. But we do have time for a couple questions. So, yes. Yeah, great question. So the question is basically testability. How do you deal with testability? Um, so there are a variety of different things that we do for testing. Um, in particular, the, the communication streams, uh, we will replace our sockets actually with stubs that simulate the socket communication back and forth. Um, the converting to void star, that's how you might want to think about the problem. That's inside of, of OSIO itself, right? So that's the buffer call that's returning, in essence, the pointer to the beginning and how many bytes that it wants to use internally. Um, so testing for communications is always hard. Um, we will stub out, we, we won't have the socket, we will have another thing that looks like the socket, which works out just to be streams of data going in and out that we can precede and then compare to make sure whether or not the data is right or not. There is no, um, there's no facility that's already there given to you, built up. I wish there was, that would be nice. Yes, yes. Right, so the question is, is there, um, in these slides, the thread that was doing the accepting was also doing the work. Is there a way to separate that? Um, so you can create an I.O. service that is doing the accepting. Most of the time, accepting is doing nothing, right? You're waiting for something to connect. Once you start that connection off, that same thread can probably handle communication, but you don't want to do work on that thread. And so what you would do is, um, in these places where I have um, you know, exercise left to the student, uh, do something with it. This do something with it is probably take and put that message somewhere else that is another thread pool that will take care of it. We use IO services to do that typically. It's another IO service that has its own set of threads. Just the IO itself. Yeah. Right. Yeah, so you can you could do one of two things. Um, so if it if the communication is too high or the accepting of connections are is too high compared to the communication, you want to separate those. Uh, you know, your first attempt might be, oh, I'm just going to add more threads to the pool. But if you want to manage that separately, those can be separate I.O. services. You have an I.O. service that's dealing with the accepts. And then your client, right now we've passed in the I.O. service, right, for our clients. And they're using the same I.O. service, which means that they have the same thread pool that's dealing with the completion handles. They all have one completion queue. If we wanted, we could have actually used a completely different I.O. service for all of our client handlers with their own thread pool. So separating those would be as simple as don't pass in the I.O. service that's the same one that's doing the accepts. Pass in a different one. And that will be the one that's handling all the communication. <laughs> Thanks, Nate. <laughs> Nate.
Nate's <laughs> laughing. So the, the general question, is there, is there a more generalized abstraction for file I.O.? There's file I.O. with this inside of, um, of Windows, is there, and they seem to be OS specific. There is a proposal that was in Boost for asynchronous file I.O. that is built on top of uh, the ASIO um, library or somewhat built on top of it. The, um, it was not accepted in this first round and uh, Niall Douglas, who's here at the conference, uh, is doing more work on it. Probably would love to talk to you about it and what you might want inside of it. Um, while, we're, while we're here, we might as well give another plug. Um, uh, Beast, if you were at the lightning talks last night, Beast is also built on this. Was our, I think our Beast guy was here at one point, waving early on. Hmm. Okay, so if you haven't seen Beast yet, it's basically HTTP bits and pieces built on top of this. If you, if you need to do HTTP type connections and communication, check that out. Uh, any of the Ripple guys probably will be able to talk to you about that. All right, thank you very much. Our session's over. It was uh, nice to have you. Thank you.